our Michal Doris Ersigo, Professor Weiss, Al Hazmana, Lavo, Leratodlik Nechem, Velkulchem Shebatem, Velahatamaha Yafa, that very my theme, She Yamra Loi. Can Kafisha Michal Amra, Yoter Noach, we would have bear be Anglit, and he Hoshevs is a Harbe Yoter Noach Gam Alechem. So the project that, uh, that I want to discuss with you today is a work in progress of mine, uh, and it stems from a problem. And the problem is to understand the Bavli in its cultural context. And I think we all understand this, it's almost van my love, that to fully understand a text, especially a text from antiquity, from places and times that are alien to us, uh, we have to understand it within its wider context, within its ambient culture. And of course, empirically, we know from the study of uh, the uh, Sifrut of Eretz Israel, from the Mishnah, from the Yerushalmi, and from the Midrashim, how much this has been enriched by Greco-Roman literature, the study of classical culture, uh, classical architecture, art, uh, so much so that there's so many sources we have a great deal of trouble understanding. I'm not just talking about words, Greek and Latin words, but really um, entire narratives, plot patterns, uh, themes, motifs that we understand because of our acquaintance with uh, classical literature. But when it comes to the study of the Bavli in the past century, it's been done mainly within the study of the Bavli itself, without a uh, awareness or without much interaction with study of the Sasanian world, the Persian Zoroastrian context. Um, you know, just one minor. Uh, you know, indication of this is if you can hardly imagine someone who would get a PhD uh, and wants to study the Roshami or the Midrashim or the Mishnah or anything to do with Eretz Israel who didn't know Greek, Latin too, ideally. But it's routine to get a, a PhD in, in study of the Bavli without knowing Pasifi, you know, without knowing Middle Persian, the ambient uh, language. Although there are good reasons for this, as I think we all know, but this just shows sort of how the study has been done in isolation. Now, the, the good reasons, the reason why it's, it, we've been so reluctant to look into it is it is very difficult, and we have to admit this. That is, to get a handle on the ambient culture is not an easy task. First of all, uh, there's very little material culture that exists from the Sasanian dynasty, the, the Persian dynasty from about 200, 220 to about 650. Uh, there's some coins, there's some cylinder seals. They had an exhibition at the, uh, the Museum for Asia, Asia Society and Museum in New York a number of years ago that brought a exhibit of Sasanian material culture from France that was billed as the greatest collection uh, in the last hundred years. I went to this uh, exhibit and it was tremendously disappointing. You have some fragments of ratty cloth, some textiles, you had a little bit of drinking goblets, some silver, <laughs> some coins, some cylinder seals. You know, that's about it. Not much was preserved. Uh, again, compared to uh, classical culture, this is very, very little. Archaeology in Iran, in Iraq, in the Sasanian world, uh, or what is today, you know, Iran and Iraq, very difficult, as we all know, for both because of the politics and the nature of the, what was preserved. Um, the, one of the main sources that we have now is magic bowls. And there's been this resurgence of interest in magic bowls that survived from this time. Many of these for years were in private collections. Scholars couldn't get their handle on them. But uh, these were written by Jewish sorcerers or magicians in Aramaic, uh, at least many of them by Jewish uh, authors. They sometimes have biblical verses. There are one or two Mishnayot or portions of Mishnayot that are quoted in the magic bowls. And Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachia is mentioned. So there is something to be learned from the study of the magic bowls, and we should do this. But they also have their limitations. The provenance, exactly where they come from, is not exactly clear. And the dating of some of these magic bowls is just not clear either. Usually they come from the black market. It's not clear where they were originally found. And then we have this corpus of Middle Persian literature, the Pahlavi literature, which presents 
its series of problems. I mean, first of all is the language itself. It's a very, very difficult language. It's not taught in that many places. Um, and much of the actual literature is late. The written copies or the written <laughs> exemplars of Pahlavi literature tends to come from the ninth century and uh, after the Islamic conquest, long after the Islamic conquest. So there's a great suspicion that this was censored and edited uh, due to the influence of Islam. It's not clear how much it really reflects Sasanian times. <coughs> Uh, we don't really have good editions of much of this literature, and it's hard to understand. Even among scholars, you sometimes have the same passage translated in two very, very different ways, because the it's almost a little like Chinese, Pahlavi. The same letters can be interpreted in, in, in different ways, depending on the word. The same symbol is used for different uh, letters. So there's no doubt that this literature should be studied, it should be exploited. There are people now doing this increasingly, and this is a very uh, very salutary trend in the study of the Bavli. Um, but I think we have to also recognize the limitations that uh, the literature presents. So we have a big problem, I think, in understanding the Bavli in its context. And it's this problem that uh, um, you know, the project I've been involved in is, is a response to. And so, you know, I say that uh, um, in a preliminary way because sometimes the solutions are not always up to the problem, but you're dealing with a very serious problem and trying to do your best to address it. So one other way to uh, get, a, get some sort of insight into the context of the Bavli is through a different corpus of literature, and this is the Syriac uh, hagiographical and martyrological and other literature. There's a vast corpus of Syriac literature that I think holds a great potential, uh, or some potential, for enlightening us in the study of the Bavli. Syriac, as you know, is a dialect of Aramaic, an Eastern dialect. It actually originates from a city, Edessa or Urfa, that's now in uh, south, uh, southeastern Turkey. It was a local dialect that became the language of the church in the East. So as Christian communities proliferated in the Sasanian world and up in Armenia and in what is now Turkey, they used this local dialect and Syriac became uh, this very, very prevalent language. And you have Syriac literature beginning really in the third century and going all the way to modern times. I mean, there's still a Syriac Christian uh, community. Now, I think there are several reasons why Syriac literature has potential to shed light on the Bavli, and really the Urshami too. I mean, I mentioned the Bavli just because uh, really attacking that problem, but Syriac was used in Eretz Israel to some extent. It was a, a widespread language. Um, so first, as opposed to Pahlavi or Middle Persian, it's a dialect of uh, Aramaic. So you have shared words, shared expressions. You have much more in common with the language of the Bavli. Second of all, the dating of this Syriac literature starts earlier than the Middle Persian literature. You have texts that, uh, from the Persian world, from the 4th century, the 5th century, the 6th century, and the 7th century. And so it's contemporaneous now with where we understand the Bavli, not just the Amoraic period, but the editing layers of the Bavli, the Stamaitic or the post-Amoraic la layers. Um, uh, and therefore, the literature has, I think, uh, the ability to shed light on the Bavli. And much of the literature, as I said, actually comes from this Sasanian world. It comes from some of the same cities where the rabbis are found, and the geography is, is much closer. Um, we don't exactly know where the Middle Persian literature comes from, but it probably comes from a little farther south in what is now Iran, rather than in what is Iraq and Mesopotamia, where the rabbis probably were, the rabbinic communities were. And you, you have other Syriac literature from Armenia and Syria, from nearby regions, part of the same cultural sphere. So I think this has the potential to be some of the best comparative material for the Bavli. And also, Judaism and Christianity are, had a similar situation, if you want, in, uh, in, uh, in the Persian world. That is, they were minority, kind of minority religions. It's a little anachronistic to use these, these words. but. Uh, as opposed to the dominant Zoroastrian religion, or the, what was most dominant religion among the elites and among the kings for most of this time. Um, so presumably, Jewish and Christian communities face similar challenges in that respect. Um, so that's a little about the Syriac literature in general. Now, I've been focusing on two main corpora, two main bodies of Syriac texts. The first is known as the Persian Martyr Acts. 
And this is a group of about 60 or 70 accounts of the lives of Christian martyrs in the Sasanian world who died at the hands of the persecutions of the uh, Sasanian kings and sometimes the religious establishment. Uh, these persecutions went on and off throughout the fourth and fifth century um, by various of the uh, Persian kings. Uh, it's, uh, it's a corpus, I say, you know, to sort of put quotation marks around that because these martyr acts were not collected into one body of literature and, and in, in antiquity, although they do exist in some medieval manuscripts, kind of many of them all together. So they were clearly studied or at least collected already uh, before modern times, but they were edited by modern scholars, collected and edited by modern scholars in the 18th and uh, 19th century. So we now have a, a corpus of 60 or 70 of these martyr texts in Syria. Uh, the second body of literature I've been looking into is a looser body of literature. We could just call it, it's usually just called the Syriac Saints, which is hagiographic literature of holy men, of usually ascetics, not martyrs, uh, this is the literature that Peter Brown, if you're familiar with his work, one of the great scholars of antiquity, uh, used a lot in his research. It's the lives and the deeds of these holy men, these ascetics, many biographical anecdotes that resemble the uh, stories, the Masim and the Bafli. There's no real corpus of these. I mean, they exist, they were published in various times and places, um, but they do date from, say, the 4th, the 5th through the 7th and 8th century. Now, one methodological note, and clearly the danger in this kind of study is what is sometimes called parallelomania, right? The sort of enthusiastic search for parallels uh, without a clear idea of, of, of what they show. And I think we have to be very much aware of this. I mean, to me, the use of parallels is either that it illuminates your text because you don't clearly understand what's going on in the text or it mutually illuminates the text when you have a rabbinic text and a Christian text that deal with the same thing or have shared motifs. <laughs> Uh, or it helps you get a better idea of some sort of social reality. What was the social setting of the rabbis? How open were they to outside culture? Were they in dialogue with other cultures? Um, did they draw on, were they facing the same problems or grappling with the same issues as other cultures? And you can perhaps learn this from parallels that you find in the text. But this is kind of the question that you know I'm struggling with and we take this up in the discussion afterwards is how useful these are or what we can possibly you know, learn from them. Okay, so um, uh, having said all this, I actually want to start with a text that doesn't come from either the Persian Martyr Acts or the Hagiographic literature, but this comes from a third sort of genre of, uh, of Syriac uh, literature, and this is known as the uh, Synodokon Orientalis. This is the proceedings of church councils that they had. Eventually, the, the churches in the east in the Persian world started having, forming a hierarchy and getting together to issue edicts and make theological pronouncements. And it was something like, some, they would publish these uh, almost proceedings of their, uh, of their meeting, sometimes legislating or making theological pronouncements and sometimes kind of just uh, records of who got together and uh, what they talked and decided upon. So if you look at this, this first text I have on, on your handout, this is from the Synod of Gregory, you could say, you can see, this was in 612 CE, so it's a 7th <laughs> century text. Um, uh, um, yeah, I didn't transcribe the Syria for this one, but you can see in the English there, uh, Gregory writes, uh, in the land of the Persians from the time of the apostles to this day, no heresy has arisen, causing schisms and divisions. In the land of the Romans, by contrast, from the time of the apostles to the present, there have been numerous and diverse heresies which have contaminated many people. When they were chased away from there, following their flight, their shadows arrived here. These include Manichaeans, Marcionites, and also the Severan Theopascites with their, with, with their malicious doctrine. So in context, right, Gregory is explaining why the theology of the Church of the East the church in the Sasanian world is superior to that of the West in the land of Israel or in the Roman world. And he's claiming that their theology is pure, whereas that of the Roman church is corrupt. And he goes on to say in another, in another one of his writings, 
you know, this is the true faith which our Lord first preached and transmitted through his 12 disciples to all who embraced and became disciples of his gospel. The faith which the ancient fathers preached and taught in their generations perfectly and without anything removed. The Catholic faith has been preserved and preached without any corruption among us, meaning among the church of the East. Our faith is pure. Our faith, our theology is unadulterated. Uh, and to me, of course, this is reminiscent of some of the writings of Pirkoi ben Baboy and the polemic between the Goanim of Babel and Eretz Israel for supremacy and for whose halachic tradition is better. This actually begins in the Talmudic period. I mean, we see reflections of this in Talmudic sources, the competition between Babel and Eretz Israel, whose Talmud Torah is better, who has the better authority. Um, so if you just look then at the section from Pirkoi ben Boy, Baboy that I've uh, excerpted here, um, I mean, it's a little later than Gregory, obviously, this is in the 8th century, but I think it's continuing a polemic. He, he has this kind of praise of the yeshivot. You can just see the second to last paragraph there in the, in the Hebrew where I've bolded. He says, V'yatan bet yeshivot lo ra'u shevi, v'lo shmad, v'lo shalal, v'lo shalat behem lo yavan, v'lo edom. And then on the next page, he, in another section, has his real polemic against the halachic tradition of Eretz Israel as being a takanat uh, shmad. It was a reaction to persecutions that you had there. Right, Shegazru, Shmad, this is the first paragraph there. Al Bene Israel, Shalo Yikru Kriat Shma, Velo Yipalalu, Veyu Minichimotam, Likanesh Shafri, Beshabbat, Veyu Omrim Kadosh, Ushma, Begniva, Veyu Osim, that is, they would say it secretly, or they would say it, I think Brody translates it as surreptitiously, because they weren't allowed to say out loud the liturgy that they wanted to. You are seen for him, Halalu be ones, the Ashav, Shekila, Kadish Barahum, Mahud, Edom, who be tell Tiratea, Ubo Yishmaelim, Vinifum, La Sok, Petora, the Likrokriat Shma, the Lipalel, Asurlomar, El Edvar, Davor, Ben Komo, Vite Dalacha, Shekainhu, Shekainhi, Vetakanat, Shmad, Hi. So Pirko is claiming the halachic tradition of Eretz Israel is the tradition of persecution and that it is corrupt as opposed to the halachic tradition of Babel that is pure, because they've never been conquered and never been subject to Greece or Rome who persecuted them. Um, uh, so I think you can see that I, I like this text because you have a kind of, I think a what we might say is a sort of similar shared mentality, a parallel mentality, almost a kind of struggle for uh, su supremacy, for primacy between the Christian communities in the Sasanian world and uh, the Jewish, the rabbinic communities in the Sasanian world. Both know that they're secondary, that Christianity and rabbinic Judaism started in Eretz Israel. And uh, it was only later that it migrated and developed in the Sasanian world. Uh, and yet, both are claiming that their tradition is purer and it really is, is better. And they, all, they both do it in their own idiom. So for Christianity, the issue is who is the pure theology? And we know they're full of theological conflicts and schisms through the whole time. But Gregory claims that the theology of the churches in the East was not corrupted by heretics and all these heresies that developed in the West. And this is, I mean, it's totally false. He says Manichaeism developed in, in, in the Roman world and then came to Persia. And we know the, re the reverse is absolutely true. Right? But it doesn't matter because he wants to claim that their theology is, is the pure one and therefore their, their, it is superior. And I think we see that same thing in, uh, in Perkoi ben Bavoy, uh, an attempt to reverse that kind of fact that they're secondary and that their tradition is later belated and claim uh, supremacy. So you know, I think this is a, it clues us into, again, a sort of shared structure, almost shared mentality of uh, Judaism and Christianity in the Sasanian world that argues for, you know, looking for more uh, what they have in, in common. Okay, so let me turn now to the uh, Persian martyr acts. Um, so this is this corpus of martyrdom texts. Now, the Persian martyr acts in general, I have to say, when it comes to the actual conception of martyrdom, is very different in the Christian texts than in rabbinic 
literature, at least in the Bavli. Um, if you're aware of the work of Boyarin and his influential book, Dying for God, he tries to kind of argue that there's a lot of similarity involved, that martyrdom develops in both uh, Judaism and Christianity at about the same time, and in very similar ways. He makes a big deal, especially of the martyrdom of Rebbe Akiba, uh, based on you know, the famous uh, the right? He sees this as a positive embrace of martyrdom, what he calls as a kind of erotics of martyrdom that's expression of love of God and a kind of mystical experience, such that martyrdom is something to be enthusiastically accepted in a certain way, as opposed to something to be avoided and, and seen as a tragedy that you, you know, tend to see in some other sources. When you read the Persian Martyr Acts as a whole, I mean, I think you see it's very, very different than most of the martyrdom texts in, in the Bavli. In the Christian text, you see much more of a longing for martyrdom. There's an enthusiasm to die. The martyr goes to his death joyous and thrilled and singing psalms and full of gratitude. There's also enthusiasm for the persecution, for the tortures, for the suffering itself as the martyrs are are being tortured, they're giving thanks to God for suffering these on behalf of Jesus. Tremendous joy also at hearing that other people have been martyred. And it says they have fulfilled their lives and this brings great satisfaction. They died a martyrdom death and not just a regular old death. Um, sometimes you even have in the Persian Martyr Acts encouragement to the persecutors to fulfill the martyrdom, to actually kill them when the, the persecutors waver for a minute or decide maybe they'll let the martyrs go. Uh, or escape, tremendous you know, aversion to escaping martyrdom when the, when the opportunity is there. There's also a kind of frowning on uh, deception as a way to avoid martyrdom, like you have in the Bavli in the story of Rebbe Elazar ben Parata, with all kinds of miracles and lies and deceptions, manages to avoid being martyred. Um, so as a whole, the kind of structure of martyrdom Qua martyrdom is different. What you do have in common are very superficial aspects of style and of form. That is, there's some fa what you might call family dramas in the Persian Martyr Act, where you have the martyrdom of a father and then his daughter, or a mother and then his son, or related family members who get martyred sequentially in their own stories. Sort of like you have in the Bavli, maybe in the story of uh, Rabbi Hanina ben Teradion, and then his wife, and then his daughter, where one leads to another. Or you have narrative cycles where one martyrdom is connected to another because of the character involved, uh, such as in the Bavli, there's a story when Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma is returning, uh, the Romans are returning from his funeral, and then they encounter Rabbi Hanina ben Teradion teaching Torah and arrest him. So the one story is connected to the other in this sort of narrative sequence. And you have that a lot as martyrdoms are built upon one another. Um, there are some similar motifs themselves, especially heavenly voices, bot calls that come when the martyrs die, such as in the martyrdom of Rebbe Akiba, where you have these Mizuman Lechaye Ha'olam Baba, or the martyrdom of the, the mother and her seven sons in Gitin, where you have Eim Ha'banim Smecha, the bot call that says this, so in the Persian Martyr Acts, often after the martyr is, is, is killed, uh, a heavenly voice comes and says something. In, in the martyrdom of Kardag, uh, the voice says, you have fought well and bravely conquered glorious Kardag. Go joyfully and take up the crown of your victory. And in another martyr, Gubar Laha, a heavenly voice, a Kala Min Shamaya comes and says, you have triumphed beautifully, come in peace. So these are, you know, there is some parallel there, but I think when you, the actual content and the construction of martyrdom is, is substantially different, you know, with all due respect to Boyarin and others who have followed in his wake, um, in, the, in the Bavli and in the Christian sources. However, the martyrdom texts also are biographical narratives, and they go through a long, often a long account of the life of the martyr before the actual martyrdom itself. And here along the way you have sorts of biographical anecdotes similar to the rabbinic accounts. And there you have much more in common between the, uh, the Christian texts and some of the Bavli's biographical narratives. So let me sh share a couple of these, uh, these parallels and you know, we'll see what we make of them. 
Um, the first one that I'd like to discuss is from a martyrdom text called The Life of Pusai, or The Acts of Pusai. It's uh, set in the year 344 during what's called the Great Persecution, that of Shapur. And the text itself probably comes from the 5th or 6th century. And it tells about a Christian named Pusai who was, a Christi uh, uh, who was martyred. It goes through a whole long uh, account of his martyrdom. And after he dies, a Christian soldier comes and collects his bones, right, the relics that are very important. And he puts them in the saddlebag of his donkey, his kamar, and then he starts to go home. And you can see this is uh, source 2A. Um, uh, this, this is the Syriac transcribed into Hebrew. Um, I'll, I'll just read the English to it for, to be a little quicker. But one of the troops who was waiting there arose from his place, he and his servant, and they approached and put the bones of the victorious Pusai into a sack, and they helped it put it on the donkey, Khamara. Uh, they went and entered the city. When they entered the city, immediately before they arrived at his dwelling, his Ashpaza, uh, there was a great darkness, and while those people were stumbling here and there on account of the darkness, the donkey walked before him. It did not go straight to the dwelling of its master, but walked down another path, and it came and stood at the gate of a certain woman, one of the daughters of the captivity. These, the daughters of the captivity were Christians who were settled by, or, we're not sure exactly how true this was, but are in the martyrdom text talk about Christians who were captured and settled in various places throughout the Sasanian Empire. So it's at a Christian, a pious Christian's home. And uh, this, this donkey then, the text goes on, it didn't quote the whole thing, stands at the doorway. The woman this, uh, doesn't know why it's there. She tries to shoo it away, and it won't move. It won't leave. And she gets her brother, and the brother takes a stick, and he tries to beat the donkey, and again, it won't leave. And eventually, they look a little closer. They look in the bags, and they find these relics, the Pusai's uh, corpse. And they take his relics in, and they eventually set up a shrine, and, uh, yeah, and then that, which becomes a church where they're found. Now, of course, uh, this righteous donkey, uh, or the donkey who won't move, sh should recall for us the story of Pinchas ben Yair, Hamoro of Pinchas ben Yair, in Kulin. And uh, you know, I've given you that text there. I assume it's familiar to everyone here. They put the barley before his chamor, but it won't eat. And then they realize that the barley hasn't been tithed sufficiently. Uh, and this donkey is too righteous right, to eat this untithed produce. And uh, you, you even have the same terms. It's ikwala uh, ushpiza. And ushpiza in the Talmud is generally an inn. In Syriac, it could be any sort of dwelling. Um, and the, this, here, of course, the, the Babli story probably comes from the Yerushalmi's version of Pinchas ben Yair, where you have another version of that, slightly different than the Bavli, where uh, Pinchas's Hamara is stolen by thieves, so it refuses to eat anything for three days, right, until it's returned. And even then, it won't eat the barley because it's demai, right? It hasn't been tied. Um, another account of this kind of holy donkey, or recalcitrant donkey, I like to say, the donkey who won't move, is that of the donkey of Yossi de Minyokrat. This is 2C. Havilea hu chamara, keda havu agri la kol yoma liorta, havu mushadri la agra, agaba, veacha le be mare, ve itafule, obatri la, loatia, yomafad inchu zuga de sandli Allah, lo azla ad de shaklun hu mina vehadar. So it wouldn't move if it wasn't paid the exact right amount or if someone had left something upon it also remained in its, in its place. Um, so here then we have several accounts of pious donkeys that act righteously. They refuse to be led astray by <coughs> humans. Uh, this donkey too of Yossi ben Yakrat won't move like the donkey carrying Kusai's uh, relics. Uh, so what can we make of these parallels? I mean, at some level, I have to, we have to think they go back to the Bible itself, right, to Bamidbar and to the Chamor of Bilam. Uh, but we have a common motif in the rabbinic and the Christian storytellers that they use for different purposes. They each use it for their own purposes. In the Bavli, it's used to illustrate this theological claim Hashta behemtan shel tzadikin ein akadosh baruch hu mevi takalal yadan tzadikin yatzman lo kol shiken, which is a problematic theological claim. Leb Waskowitz has written about that, but whatever. That's what Bavli uses the story to illustrate. Um, 
The Yerushalmi doesn't make this claim. It rather teaches that the donkey was stricter than the rabbis. The donkey was more machmir. It might even be some sort of criticism, right, of the rabbis who are willing to take shortcuts who don't aspire to such standards. And in the story of Yossi ben Yakra, it's to model some sort of piety, right? One shouldn't ever cheat anyone or take more or less than what's due. Um, which might have something in common with the Bobli version of Pimpas ben Yair too, that the, the donkey prevents the rabbis from some sort of inadvertent sins, like the donkey of Yossi ben Yakra. Uh, in the life of Pusai, what's going on is that the righteous donkey causes the relics to arrive at an appropriate location ultimately a church or shrine, rather than this soldier's private house. I mean, the donkey refuses to enter his house and goes on its own to a pious Christian woman. And eventually what happens is they set up a, a, a shrine. And this seems to have been a tension or a conflict within the Syriac church in the 5th and 6th century, which was the correct disposal or deposition of the relics or saints. There was an attempt by some private individuals to hold these. They were considered holy. They were considered great luck if you had this at your house. That was a status symbol. Uh, but there was a movement among the church officials to have these at public shrines or public churches so that more people could have access to them. And that seems to be the point of the story of this donkey who refuses to go to the one's house and, uh, and goes to the right kind of woman who sets up the shrine. So I think we can say that both of the, uh, both of the storytellers use this motif for their own didactic aims, um, their own didactic purposes. And again, you know, the question we have is how significant are these uh, observations? Does this allow us to kind of either see Christianity and Judaism in dialogue, uh, or you know, is this simply using the same motif for, for different purposes? All right, let me turn to a second uh, parallel, and this one has to do with, uh, with, with Sadducees. It comes from a text called The Life of Mar Saba, uh, which is probably written in the 6th or 7th century. And uh, in the story of Mar Saba, he converts a, vi a village of Kurds to Christianity, uh, which he does by causing a big idol that they have in the middle of their village to shatter. And then he is accosted by a Sadducee, by the chief Sadducee from a village of Sadducees that was nearby. This is source 3A, right? Itwataman Krita Chada de Tzadukaya. There was a city of uh, Sadducees, Kirchaza, Rasha de Tzadukaya de Taman. The chief Sadducee of the place came. Bekat Chaza Enon Shal Bashal Mahon, Upatach Pume. Right? There is no resurrection, no revivifying of the dead, and nor any judgment. Now, Mar Saba in the text responds that if the Sadducee is correct, he'll, turn, uh, he'll return to his own village in peace. But if, he do, if he's incorrect, if there is a resurrection and revival of the dead, then he won't. And then immediately the Sadducee is lifted up from his place into the air, He's dashed to the ground. An angel of God comes and strikes him dead. Everybody at that point says, great is the God of the Christians. And uh, this isn't enough for Marsaba, though. He then gestures toward a mountain nearby. The whole mountain breaks off and lands on the village of the Sadducees and destroys all of them. And the narrator tells us the place of that village is unknown to the present day. Um, yeah, I guess that's good proof. What can you say? Now, what has troubled scholars of this text is this reference to a village of Sadducees in the 6th century in the Sasanian world, because there's no known you know, community of Sadducees, uh, I don't know, exists anywhere, let alone right in uh, Sasania, Persia. Um, and the general trend has been to identify these Sadducees with some other kind of heretical group that we know about. So Epiphanius of Salamis, who's a Christian writer, writes about all sorts of heretical groups in the 4th, in the 5th, and the 6th century with all sorts of different theologies. And scholars of, of this text have said the Sadducees represent this, the, this, uh, the, these heretics or those heretics. The trouble is that a lot of the heretical groups that, uh, that scholars have identified the this, this Sadducee with um, are also not known from the Persian world. Epiphanius is writing about the uh, Greco-Roman world. Um, 
and also the Sadducees' rejection of resurrection and uh, life in the next world isn't usually associated with these Christian heretical groups. Of course, it is similar to what the Sadducees are uh, presented as in the New Testament and in Josephus and even in Avot de Rabbi Natan. Um, the Bible discusses the Sadducees in several places. Most of these are simply elaborations of Tanaitic texts, but there are also these dialogues between rabbis in Minim, although in the printed versions of the Talmud you often have Tzeduki or Tzedukim, um, uh, in which they debate these theological questions. So if you look at um, source 3b, right, this is from Sanhedrin Sadi Anubed, Shalu Minim, or in this case, we actually have Saduki in the Geniza fragment and in some of the uh, manuscripts. Shalu Minim, or Saduki at Rabban Gamaliel, Minayin Shea Kadosh Baruch Hu, Mechayei Metim, Amar Lehem Mina Torah, Mina Nevi'in, Mina Ketuvim, Veloki Blu Mimenu. Um, so a similar challenge to the rabbis from a group that rejects resurrection. Christine Hayes has written about these texts and argues these aren't really historical, but these are rabbis working out their own anxieties, projecting difficult uh, theological questions on others as a safer way or a less problematic way to deal with them. You externalize them, you pro project them as a challenge from others so they can be refuted. And, and I think that's probably how we should see this encounter between Mar Saba and the Sadducees too shouldn't really look for a historical kernel, as some scholars have. Rather, Mar Saba's triumphs over the pagans, uh, the Kurds, and the Sadducees demonstrate his superior powers to pagans and to heretics. Um, the Sadducees are probably just a general literary representation of some sort of opponent or heretic. And the anxiety in the life of Mar Saba it's not so much exegetical, that is, where do you find Fiata Metim in the Torah, or in the Nevi'im, that's what Rabban Gamaliel is struggling with, but it's simply a question of authority and personality. Does Mar Saba truly possess pos uh, divine power? And the fact that he's able to shatter this idol in the village, and then he's able to triumph over this Sadducee, I mean, literally kill him, uh, demonstrates his power by his miracles, by his divine authority. Uh, both the Talmud, I think, and the martyrdom text are employing a kind of literary figure of the Sadducee uh, to address anxieties and portray challenges to legitimate religious authorities, which are then successfully met, each in their own way. Okay, um, another example then, many of the Persian martyr acts feature theological discussions between martyrs and the Sasanian kings. And the Sasanian kings are generally portrayed very negatively in the uh, Persian martyrdom acts. The, 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 uh, the Persian kings claim divinity, they claim to be divine or the representative of divinity on earth. And so this was a really a conflict between who is the true God, the Persian king, or Jesus, the God of the Christians, and should the identity of Christians be understood in relation to the Persian king and Iranian society, or to the Christian community and to God. Uh, in rabbinic literature, Zoroastrian kings are usually portrayed a lot more favorably. I mean, especially Shapur, we don't have that many, but they don't have quite have the negative portrayals you find in the Persian martyr acts, and you don't have real theological debates so much among rabbis and the kings. But you do have some of the theological questions that come up in these dialogues between the Persian martyrs and the kings in rabbinic sources. So if you look at the, uh, actually, source, go to page five for this one, the last, uh, the last page, where you have the parallel columns. Um, In Bavli Brachot, we have this famous story of this Hasid who won't interrupt his prayer, right? I think this is well known. Tana Rabbanan, Maseh Bechasid Echad, Shaya Mipalel Baderech, Ba Hegemon Echad, Venatan Lo Shalom, Velo Hechzir Lo Shalom, right? He refuses to interrupt his prayer, and he says, I could have killed you, and this is so disrespectful, and eventually, uh, this Hasid explains, Ilu Hayita Omed, Lifnei Melech Basar Vedam, Ba Chavercha, Benatan lecha shalom, hayita machzirlo, marlo love. Vayim hayita machzirlo, mayo asim lecha. 
Amar lo hayu chotchim ed roshi besayif. Amar lo velo dvarim kal v'chomer umata shayit almed lifnei melech basar v'dam shayom kan umachar bekever kach. Ani shayit almed lifnei melech malchei amlachim akadosh baruch hu shehu chay v'kayam le'adol omi omimim alachat kama v'kama. This kind of dialogue and this motif of not interrupting prayer occurs in the, a martyrdom known as the Martyrs of Tur Bahrain. These are two brothers and a sister who end up converting to Christianity. They are the children of a sultan, a local sultan, and the daughter is actually supposed to be betrothed to the Persian king to be part of his harem. And uh, in the course of this, it's a, very, it's a fairly long text. And it's actually one that has an English translation. Uh, uh, Sebastian Brock, one of the great scholars of Syriac, uh, t has translated this for a series that Adam Becker, my colleague at NYU, is editing, which is uh, translating these Persian martyr acts into English. Many of these don't have translations. Some just have old Latin or German translations that are not even complete translations. So they've done four or five of these already, and among them this Martyrs of Torberain. Um, so in the context of this, uh, the king sends a kind of servant, a confidant of his, to go and uh, you know, bring back the, these children who are rebelling, who are, have become Christian and refuse to come to his court. So you can see in the middle column, uh, the confidant gave them the greeting from Shapur the king, but they did not reply with a single word to him. They're in the middle of prayer at this point. And he was greatly annoyed and said to them, oh, people worthy of an evil death, do you not accept the greeting of the great king Shapur? Even so, they didn't give any reply at all. He throws a rock at them, but it miraculously bounces back and hits him in the head. And um, eventually, then, he keeps silent, right? So he kept silent until they completed their prayer. And then when I underlie it again, they say similar things. The saints then said to him, we're asking you to speak the truth to us. If you are willing to do so, is God or man great? He replied, without any doubt, God is great. They went on. Why then were you angry when we were speaking with God in prayer and we did not accept from you the greeting of Shapur as a human being, just like everyone else? Um, so again, this I think is not such a surprising theology and you find this in various places, the comparison between an earthly king and the Melech Malchayim Lachim. Uh, I think it's a little rarer to find it in the context of refusing to interrupt prayer and then having to remain silent until the prayer is over, and then continuing the dialogue. This you have in both of these, uh, both of these texts. Um, uh, and you, ha you have a similar thing, actually, in the Acts of Kardak, and this is the third column, not in the, in the context of prayer, but similar sentiments, you know. Which is more grievous, that I should revolt against a wretched man who today blooms and is full of pride, but for whom there's no tomorrow, or revolt against the heavenly king of kings, whose kingdom does not pass away, whose divinity does not change. Um, so there, it is different dealing with different contexts, because the story of the Hasid is not in the context of a martyrdom account. I mean, he could have been killed, but it's really just a Roman, a hegemon, who accosts him on the, on the, uh, on the way, whereas this is in the context of martyrdom accounts in the Syriac texts. Um, but I still think you, know, you have a very close parallel which could point to some sort of uh, shared experience or some sort of dialogue between the, the Jewish and the Christian communities. All right, let me look at one final example, and then we can sort of wrap it up and, and go to discussion, this motif of collapsing buildings. This is from the uh, hagiographic literature, not from a martyrdom text. It's from a text called The Life of Peter the Iberian, uh, written by John Rufus. Peter the Iberian lived 410 to 491, so the late 5th century, although uh, his life was written in the next century. Iberia here, by the way, is not Spain and Portugal. It's not the Iberian Peninsula. Iberia at this time also referred to what we now call Georgia, it's sometimes called Iberia of the Caucasus. It's territory just north of Armenia that was part of the Sasanian Empire or under Sasanian influence uh, for a while, and there are a bunch of Christian martyrs who come from there. Um, so uh, in this text, um, the, uh, the author is trying to explain how holy Peter was and giving him a kind of genealogy of holiness. And he, so he explains about his grandmother and his nursemaid and their holiness in terms of preventing the collapse of various buildings. So source 5A and 5B, this is on page 4. 
Uh, Astuptia, the paternal grandmother of the Blessed Peter, was so holy in every respect that after her death, when a guard post that was under construction was collapsing during an earthquake, the collapsing ceased immediately when her body was brought out and laid there like that of one of the saints. These are just, uh, a guard post under construction, I assume it was sort of not fully built, so maybe it was, or it could have been, I guess, completely sound, but anyway, they were constructing it. But her body prevented it from collapsing, and in the very next paragraph, he tells us the blessed Zuzo, who reared the blessed one, that is Peter, uh, was so holy that when Peter was, as an infant, when he was sleeping at her side, she would often drench him with tears when she rose up at night and was saying the following words in the Iberian language, Lord Jesus, my God and giver of my life, have mercy on me. Once when there was an earthquake and everything was shaking, while the Blessed One was running about in her house, which had eight apses, she held onto the pillars and cried out with boldness, Lord, see how I have served you and spare me and my children. Her prayer did not allow her house to suffer any loss, although this earthquake ruined many at the time. Um, so I think these sources, of course, should recall for us the stories of rabbis who prevent rickety or dilapidated uh, rooms, houses from collapsing, Rabat Barahava and Nathumish Gamzu, I get up the text here somewhere. Um, Rav attributes the power of Rabat Barahava to his great merit, Nafish Sukhute, and the Bavli then lists various meritorious deeds that Ravada did, which explain why he had this miraculous power to prevent uh, rickety or dilapidated buildings, right? A beta ri'ua or ri'ia or ri'ata, the different years out, uh, from collapsing that Ravada Barava never lost his temper and never walked in front of a superior in learning and never went without filling and so forth. And Nathomish Gamzu, of course, was so holy because he had accepted the suffering on himself and was in such a miserable condition. So we have a variation of the same motif. It's in the rabbinic accounts, it, it, the, the, the saint, the rabbi's body prevents a house that ordinarily could have collapsed, right? It was a rickety house from collapsing. In the life of the Peter of Iberian, the holy woman and the holy woman's body prevent the collapse of what seems to be a sound house. There's just an earthquake. So all the other houses are collapsing except for this one. And uh, in the second uh, account, Zuzo, the nursemaid, actually does a prayer. It's not simply the presence of the body, right? In the account of Rabbi uh, Rabada Barava, the fact that his body's there, he doesn't even know. You know, Rav Huna in the story brings him in there, and he actually is a little annoyed afterwards that Rav Huna brought him into the house without his knowledge that would have, uh, have collapsed. Here she actually prays that it doesn't coll collapse. But uh, the protective power of preventing buildings from collapsing is the mark of extreme holiness. Now, I think this is actually a fairly rare motif. I, if anybody knows where else this appears, I would love to uh, hear. I was only able to found it in a couple 13th or 14th century Christian hagiographies where a, a, a saint somehow prevents a building from collapsing. Um, so I think we can ask, you know, what is the significance of this? In the Christian sources, the ability marks the holiness of the saint, Peter the Iberian's ancestor and his teacher, which contributes to what we might call a genealogy of holiness, uh, which is a theme of the life. His holy ancestry and his holy upbringing is what contributed to making Peter the holy man that he became. The Talmud uses the ability of Ravada Barahava to prevent these collapses is a didactic opportunity to list acts of piety that the audience might want to emulate in order to achieve that level of holiness. That might be what's going on in the, in the account of Zuzo, the nursemaid. She was so holy, she constantly prayed, constantly bathed him with tears, and that's what gave her the ability. You know, that's a, kind of her pious acts that might want to be emulated. So uh, the uses of the motif have something in common. Uh, uh, but again, they're used for their own didactic purposes, what virtues are important to the author of the Syriac text and what's the author of, or the storyteller in the Bible. Um So anyway, uh, these are just some of the examples, and I have many more examples that are along these lines that, you know, uh, could go through. Um, you know, provisionally, my conclusion, I would say, is simply that Syriac sources like these, they're not going to be a key to unlocking the secrets of the Bavli. Um, 
They're, they're not going to give us massive new insights about rabbinic Judaism in Babylonia. They won't lead to a kind of revision of our prevailing ideas. But I think they do have the ability to show us that the rabbis were in some sort of constant dialogue with Christians. There was an interchange of stories and ideas. Um, and I think, again, given the problems that we're facing, the absence of outside literature in which we can set the Bavli and the Bavli stories in a larger context, that this literature should continue to be explored. Uh, and in this way, we could potentially explain some of the Bavli biographical narratives better, get a better sense of the social setting of the rabbis, their place in Babylonia, and round out our picture, you know, if not in, in, great, in great detail, but, but certainly um, you know, contribute to what we know. Thank you. Thank you.